we will uh, conclude today by touching on some of the questions of morality, I think in a uh, much calmer environment, um, aware of the fact that there are some uh, unique LDS perspectives perhaps uh, on this issue of Iraq, and we are at an institution where we are uh, welcomed and, uh, and encouraged to, to discuss those. So we thought this would be an important way uh, to end uh, today's session. Um, we're very grateful to have uh, Dr. Robert Freeman of the uh, College of Religion and Lieutenant Colonel David Kirkham of the U.S. Air Force Academy. Um, Robert Freeman is an associate professor in the College of Religion at BYU. In addition, he is co-director of the Saints at War Project, which was established in the year 2000 for the purpose of gathering the experiences of Latter-day Saints in, the 20, in 20th century conflicts. In partnership with both the BYU Special Collections Library and the National Library of Congress Veterans History Project, the project is responsible for preserving the accounts of approximately 1,400 veterans from both, both World War I and World War II, as well as the Korean and Vietnam conflicts. Lieutenant Colonel David Kirkham is Deputy Department Head for International History and an Associate Professor at the United States Air Force Academy. He is a U.S. Air Force Foreign Area Officer for Europe and Africa, an International Political Military Affairs Officer, and formerly a United Nations Senior Humanitarian Affairs Officer and member of the Air Force Department of the Judge Advocate General. He holds a law degree from the J. Reuben Clark School of Law, a Ph.D. in American Civilization from George Washington University, and is a graduate of the German Federal Armed Forces General Staff College in Hamburg, Germany. His, interest, his academic interests include war crimes, international humanitarian law, human rights, and comparative revolutions and constitutions. Uh, as is keeping with the, uh, the pattern today, I'll be happy to turn the time over to each of our two panelists. And uh, if we have time remaining, we will open up uh, for discussion amongst the panelists and, and questions from the floor. We decided who would like to go first. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, coming out and thank you for inviting me here. I told Corey I'd do this even if there was only one person here and my daughter's a student and she's here. I knew she'd be here, so I knew I'd be doing this. I spent many happy years here. I wear a number of hats today. I am a practicing Latter-day Saint. I am a member of the United States Air Force, have been for 20 years. I am a lawyer whose responsibilities earlier as a, an Air Force lawyer was uh, on occasion to interview conscientious objectors, military members who were claiming conscientious objector status all of a sudden or progressively in wanting to get out. And uh, I'm a scholar whose interests have included for a long time this concept of a higher law tradition in America uh, that has often led to civil disobedience and so forth. Wearing all those hats, I have to give my disclaimer. I'm going to do this uh, by way of a short anecdote. When I was a graduate student, I had a, a book with me everywhere I went. And one afternoon, I was going out to pick up my daughter from a school bus. Uh, I'd always meet her at the end of our long driveway. I got up a couple of minutes early. Trash cans were out. I leaned on the trash cans, reading my book. The garbage truck drives up. A young man in his early 20s jumps off and he looks at me and he says, ah, the trash toter thinker, what are you reading? And I said, oh, just a little constitutional history. What do you think of that? And he says, well, it's okay if you're a conservative. And then he goes on for the next two minutes to give me a very sophisticated view of constitutional development in the United States. I was absolutely in awe. He jumps on the truck, drives down the road about 20 yards, slams on the brakes, sticks his head out the window and yells, these views do not necessarily represent the views of this company. And then he continued on. So these views today do not necessarily represent the views of the LDS Church or the United States Air Force Academy or the United States Air Force. The United States does have a long tradition of acknowledging a, a higher law. There has, a, if, if you go back, for example, even the Puritans setting up the, a city on a hill, that was an act of conscience in and of itself. And there were dissenters among those Puritan communities who, like Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams, who were expelled from the communities because they themselves also 
claim to adhere to a, a higher law and disagreeing with the community. I would argue that that tradition uh, is continued on through the uh, American Revolution, and, and I'm not going to take the time today to give an entire uh, historic discourse, but we have had our uh, abolitionists, our suffragettes, our civil rights march, marchers, our, our conscientious objectors. We've even had our Mormon pioneer ancestry who have at time, one time or another have laid claim to this higher law. Um, in times of war in this country, given what's at stake, emotions run high and you begin to, begin to hear once again this resort to a higher law of nonviolence. Uh, a, a very close at home anecdote that we've just experienced over at the Air Force Academy. And in fact, uh, you may have seen some publicity on this. Uh, just a matter of a couple of weeks ago, we had a young freshman a student who was engaged in organizing what we call our Academy Assembly. It's a yearly forum where we invite students from universities from all over the country to come over and and uh, share views on public issues and so forth. And so this young man, not necessarily following the way it's normally supposed to, done, to be done, he sent some emails out to various professors around the country and asked them if they can help uh, invite some students to come participate in our Academy Assembly. Well, he received an email back from a full professor of history at a Midwestern university. And I'm going to share the text of this email with you. He, uh, the university professor replied, You are a disgrace to this country, and I am furious you would even think I would support you and your aggressive baby-killing tactics of collateral damage. Help you recruit. Who? Top guns to rain death and destruction upon non-white people throughout the world? Are you serious, sir? Resign your commission and serve your country with honor. No war, no Air Force cowards who bomb countries without AAA, without possibility of retaliation. You are worse than the snipers. You are imperialists who are turning the whole damn world against us. September 11th can be blamed in part for what you and your cohorts have done to the Palestinians, the Viet Cong, the Serbs, a retreating army at Basra. You are unworthy of my support. Signed this professor, and significantly, he added his title and the university that he was from. Well, uh, we at the Air Force Academy tend to characterize our role a little differently, and uh, there, there is sort of a side lesson to be learned from this that, that, that's worth sharing with any particular audience. When the young man received this email, uh, I know he was taken aback, but didn't necessarily react violent, violently, but he forwarded it on to a friend who forwarded it on to a friend, who forwarded it on to a couple of more friends. And uh, after this professor had received between 40 and 60 responses from the Air Force Academy alone, we managed to sort of put it in check at the Air Force Academy and say, students don't write any more letters to a uh, professor. But then the next thing you know, you go to the professor's website, and, and on that website he claims to be an adherent of nonviolence. And... On his website, he says, I've received, I'm receiving about 150 emails a day on this topic. Uh, then pretty soon, the next thing you know, there's a message coming out from the president of this university saying, we are receiving thousands of emails and letters and telephone calls on this topic. We uh, have set up a special faculty uh, council to answer the phones day in and day long, and we're looking at this professor's uh, tenure situation and trying to determine whether or not his contract should be reviewed and the last thing, actually, and this was in U.S. News and World Report this past week, he has been relieved of his teaching responsibilities for this for the next semester and a half. So, uh, whether you agree or not with that uh, outcome, um, there there certainly has been in this country uh, these this kind of wartime fever gives rise to these kinds of controversies. Now, having said that, and even if this man is suffering for what he claims free speech, and I say it's significant that he, he put his title and put the university he was from in the email because the justification they have used for relieving him of his duties is that he acted as if he were speaking for the university. Um, the, the, actually, it's a very interesting situation then to have uh, to have a nation where, that actually encourages its citizens to take up arms in defense of the the nation when necessary, but all the while recognizes that there is this right to refrain according to conscience. 
we have been highly tolerant as a society over all of that. Even if people, if, even if there are shouting matches and even if there are situations uh, uh, like this per professor is now currently facing for expressing his view, we're not one of those societies who would take uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and execute them before because they refuse to p pay uh, allegiance to the the nation, to the flag, and so forth. Um, and uh, this has had been embedded in our law. The Universal Military Training and Service Act exempts from service those who, and this is quote, by reason of religious training or belief are conscientiously opposed to participation in war in any form. The Supreme Court has taken that and even broadened it further, and they have said things like, well, religious training doesn't really mean necessarily mean religious religious training. It can be something similar to religious training. This has all come into our, our military regulations. Uh, I'm particularly um, uh, familiar with the Air Force regulations that say anyone that holds a deeply held ethical, moral conviction that they are against war, according to conscience, based on religious or similar training, can claim this conscientious objector status. However, they have to be opposed to all wars. They can't just say, I didn't like the Viet don't like the Vietnam War, but World War II was okay. And uh, some of the time, some of the responsibilities I had when I was interviewing uh, people on this, uh, I had a couple within a couple of months of each other. One time, one fellow comes in and says, just decided that my conscience won't let me do this anymore. He was a security police officer. He carried a sidearm. He was supposed to protect the gate and so forth. And, uh, and my job was to interview and find out, okay, is this true? Does he really, is he really a conscientious objector or does he just want to get out of the Air Force? And so I said, well, what made you decide that? Well, I've just been thinking about it. Well, have you been r reading some religious literature or philosophical literature or had discussions about this or uh, have you had a religious conversion? What's going on? No, I've just been thinking about it. And so I'm left in a little bit of a quandary, and he he leaves, and his commander comes to me and says, well, what do I do? Do we let him out or not? Is he a conscientious objector? And I said, well, who am I to judge? He says, well, uh, give him an order, a direct order to put on his gun and go back out and defend the gate. And if he doesn't do it, then he's a conscientious objector. And so that's not standard operating procedure for the Air Force, but it worked. And so anyway, many will link the uh, conscious, uh, conscientious objection phenomenon in the United States with the war in Vietnam. And, and I, I really need to uh, assure you that it goes way, way back before the war in Vietnam. Every war has seen conscientious objectors, um, not as much in World War II proportionally, but World War I certainly. But if you go back to Henry David Thoreau, why did he end up in jail writing his uh, famous treatise on civil disobedience? It was because he was opposed to the Mexican War, opposed to paying a tax that would go to support the Mexican War. So it's a long time uh, thing in, in uh, our country. Having said that, uh, Vietnam War definitely gave force to this and brought it to the forefront. Now, most of you here are too young, are either not born or too young to really remember the, the Vietnam era. A few of you know that, what it was like. I remember it very well because I was an 18-year-old freshman, turned 18, living down here in Helaman Halls on the day that they uh, pulled out my draft lottery number, and it was a very high draft lottery number, and I remember breathing a sigh of relief. Not because my friends and I were anti-war necessarily or even had deep uh, feelings uh, in our conscience about it, although the war had become, it was 1972, it had be kind of, become kind of murky by then and it was hard to get very excited about it and we just wanted, we wanted to go on missions and get our educations and, and, and get married and, and besides, who wanted to go into the military? Certainly not I. And they, however, the church did not leave, give us a way out. The church has always abhorred war, but has also recognized the allegiance that we owe our governments. And the official church position has always been, at least in the 20th century, actually forever, has been that um, we do not have the right to claim conscientious objector simply by virtue of being a member of the church. Let me share with you uh, from the Encyclopedia of Mormonism how, how this has come out. While any member of the church is free to object to military combat service because of conscience, simply holding membership in the church in and of itself is not a justification. Church leaders have discouraged conscientious objection in every conflict of the 20th century. 
although it is opposed to war and recognizes that going to war is a very poor alternative means of resolving contracts, conflicts, the church con considers it the loyal duty of citizenship for members to answer the call of their various countries for military service. At the same time, it recognizes the right of individual members to determine for themselves whether their deep spiritual consciences will allow them to serve in combat or require them to request assignment or alternate service. The church will not support a member in that request until he or she is consulted with the appropriate bishop and stake president and has spiritual confirmation that the way decided upon by the member concerned is acceptable to the Lord. Uh, this is given... A, l a little bit of confusion at times. I have some correspondence. I'm not going to go through it here, but uh, letters to the editor. Someone had written a, in, to a Florida newspaper. That there had been an article that had said that during the Korean War, Mormons took all their 18-year-old men and shipped them off on missions to keep them from having to, to serve. And then that created a response. Another one wrote to the paper and said... Uh, uh, I said, I served in the Navy Medical Corps with many Mormons and Adventists, and even though they are not allowed by their conscience to, to carry arms, they did a great job in the Medical Corps, and I think very highly of these Mormons and Adventists. So there are these, this, this fellow, whoever that was, that was working with these Mormons and Adventists, I didn't talk to them about why they were there, I guess, but uh, there, there is uh, still con considerable confusion. It seems to me that... Uh, Although then we can claim private conscience, we can't get out of military service just by being a member of the church. Um, there's, I think, more relevant than is Elder Robert Oak's comment that he wrote here uh, a while back. Uh, at that time, he was not General Authority Oaks; he was just General Oaks, and uh, stated that we abhor bloodshed. We don't enjoy it, and that's where the conscience really comes to play. Um, the conscience, are, we of all people, Latter-day Saints, need to understand that the conscience isn't going to necessarily just decide one way fits all. And it's not going to tell us necessarily that nonviolence is always the option. Conscience can compel us to do something as well as restrain us from doing something. And the conscience issue for me comes to part place if you're already engaged in a war, whether you wanted to go there or not, if you're a draftee or not. Many of you will remember the uh, My Lai Massacre. Now, I teach this war crimes course over at the Air Force Academy. We start out with Nuremberg, and we basically take our students through Yugoslavia and Rwanda and Sierra Leone and, and Cambodia. We talk about Armenian genocide. And as soon as the students are absolutely all convinced that uh, the world is a terrible place and the Americans are the only good guys, then we do this mean thing to them and hit them with the My Lai Massacre, which for those of you who aren't familiar with it, occurred in Vietnam in March of 1968 when Charlie Company, an uh, uh, infantry company of the U.S. Army, went into a Vietnamese village and, asked, and massacred uh, anywhere between 250 to 500 old men, women, and children. There was not a single military-aged male uh, combatant in the group. It became worse. Members of Charlie Company raped women in the camp before they killed them, women of a very young age sometimes. They cut off their ears on occasion. They cut out their tongues. They scalped them. It was a horrific thing. It was a black, uh, dark spot in our nation's history. Um, now, there were two, at least two Latter-day Saints who were members of Charlie Company. And... Uh, the one one of the first people to investigate this and find out about it, and he, who who actually knew them quite well, he said he was shocked to find out that these two people had been there because he knew them to be uh, Mormons. Let me I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, I'm not going to share any names with you. Uh, but during the I don't know where this person is now, but during the investigation, he actually lived in in Orem, and so um, I, I'm not here to judge, but I'm here to, to point out uh, a particular situation. I'll just call him John Doe. Knowing John Doe's deeply held Mormon faith, his story of what happened in the village was deeply affecting. Ridenauer, the investigator, considered John Doe to be honest, sincere, and decent, someone he was proud to call a friend. He felt chilled to his soul. Here, John Doe was telling how, as, he, as the squad broke for lunch, he and his friend Doherty had taken part in the killings. Billy Doherty and I started to get out our chow, John Doe said, but close to us were a bunch of Vietnamese in a heap, and some of them were moaning. Callie's platoon had been through before us, and all of them had been shot, but many weren't dead. 
it was obvious that they weren't going to get any medical attention, so Billy and I got up and went over to where they were. I guess we sort of finished them off. Then they returned to their packs and ate their lunch. Um, this, when he was investigated here in Orem, uh, the investigator said, I came across a man, a young man who was in deep anguish for what he had experienced, and yet he was convinced that what he had done had been a mercy killing. The other Latter-day Saint, it's less clear, and I'm, I'm drawing this from all the sources I've been able to see on this, it's less clear what he actually did. It appears he was not drawn into this, um, but he... Uh, he, he actually was uh, a keen observer in, uh, of, the, of the entire situation. He wasn't necessarily a hero who stood up and said, okay, you guys, let's knock it off. But it says the, this person's version, I'll call him James Smith, James Smith's version of how the moral certainties of his Mormon upbringing crumbled in the face of what he saw in Charlie Company. We believe this behavior was pretty commonplace, he said. I didn't think we were doing anything different from any other unit. You really do lose your sense not of right or wrong, but your degree of wrong changes, a different set of rules, and I don't think that any of us quite knew what those rules were. So war in and of itself is a war against the conscience. It sets us up in a situation where it is so, so very difficult for us to maintain, unless we have prepared ourselves in advance, a clear view on what is right and, and what is wrong. It, the, uh, uh, and I know I'm, I need to draw to a conclusion here so in a sense, but many of you are familiar with a contrasting story of Helmut Hubner. Helmut Hubner was a young boy, 16 years of age at the beginning of the Second World War, who lived in Germany, uh, who was a Latter-day Saint. And at least in part, it appears, uh, because of conscience, he began to listen to uh, broadcasts from the BBC, which was illegal in Germany, write out in little leaflets uh, the, what the British were saying and w write anti-Hitler leaflets. Then he would sneak into the LDS church at night and use the mimeograph machine and run them off. And he and a couple of his friends then would distribute those throughout Hamburg, Germany. Well, they were caught and uh, Hubner paid with his life. He actually was executed. His two friends both served time in jail. And it's a fascinating story, or time in a concentration camp. And I wish I could tell you in detail. I actually was just talking to my students at the Air Force Academy about these folks this week. But uh, one of the interesting things to me is that I, I, I've known about Hubner for many, many years. There was a play about him when I was here as an undergraduate that affected me very strongly. And about the same time I moved to Hamburg, Germany, to attend the German staff college, a book was edited, published by Alan Kiel, a religion, or I mean, a German professor here, uh, that was the account of one of these three young men. So I was reading the book. I just moved to Hamburg, and it said that Helmut Hubner attended the Alton Award in Hamburg, Germany, and these were his friends, and I attended the Alton. I was attending the Alton Award in Hamburg, Germany, and they listed his friends and. I said to my wife, hey, look, there's Bruder Fricke. He was Helmut Hubner's friend. This is this old curmudgeonly guy that we see every Sunday when we go to church, but he's really good to me. You know, he's always giving me stuff. So I go to see Brother Fricke the next uh, Sunday. I said, hey, did, is it true you knew Helmut Hubner? And he just bristled. And he slapped his hand on the table and he says, I knew Helmut Hubner and he was no hero. He almost got us all killed. The heroes were those fighting on the Russian front. And so, here we have another, uh, uh, if, if I, I was startled, I was startled, but another reaction, uh, uh, another LDS reaction to war, where conscience was uh, perhaps followed uh, more in a way that we would hope so, but it, I don't know, the story gets more complicated than that, but I don't have time to go into it right now. Uh, in the end, examples of individual conscience abound uh, in, in our own history, in Latter-day Saint scripture. Uh, examples of both conscience restraining us and compelling us. And if you look at the Book of Mormon, for example, uh, I don't want to get into the theological distinction here between whether, between whether it's the conscience of the Spirit of Christ telling him or the distinction between that and the Holy Ghost in the case of Laban, but certainly there was a case there where commanded by God to take action, he did something that normally we would think of as an immoral act. Um, Moroni, brandishing the title of liberty. Again, when you read about him and what a, what a man of God he was in good conscience, and yet he led his people into war. And yet Moroni was said to be a man who did not delight in bloodshed. On, a, on the other hand, we see cases of restraint. We see the anti-Nephi-Lehi's who bury their arms and say, from now on, I, I will not go to war. 
Uh, you see Mormon relinquishing command at the, finally when he says his people are just so wicked, he can't do it anymore. And I would suggest that he became, a, in sort, a conscientious objector. And in, in the end, I would suggest that we of all people should understand that's not a situational ethics thing by any means. That there is, but there is a, a natural law. There is a, there is a, a, a Holy Ghost, and there is a conscience that what we know as the Spirit of Christ that will enlighten us and give us give us the ability to make distinctions in very very complex situations. Uh, and uh, it's that that I would suggest is much more important than whether or not. The church uh, allows you to, uh, act, to, just by virtue of being a member of the church, to claim conscientious objector status. That part's dispatched with fairly quickly. The real question is, what will your conscience, what will my conscience do uh, in time of war? Thank you very much. Corey, I feel like uh, we're, I am the only religion professor on the schedule today. I'm somehow supposed to be offering a benediction to the uh, proceedings here. <clears throat> and I was not aware that we would not be available the services of uh, Ron Walker and Grant Underwood prior to this uh, hour's uh, convening. And I'm getting that may have been a late uh, uh, obstacle that they encountered. And I'm, I'm only disappointed from the standpoint that... Uh, I have known uh, Grant for 15 years or so and admired his work, and he's um, a very articulate spokesman in the area that he was going to address. And then I've admired uh, very much uh, Ron Walker's work. And uh, in fact, I teach a course on this campus uh, entitled Latter-day Saints in Wartime, and his uh, writings are mandatory reading for my students. So you would have... Uh, we would have been benefited much from uh, each of their perspectives, I'm sure. I'm especially pleased to make acquaintance with Lieutenant uh, Colonel David uh, Kirkham today and and uh, want him to know that uh, where, where are they? I'm not before the hour uh, making a connection where we would know each other or, or uh, have, have a lot in common. I'm seeing now that at least we share in common that we're both uh, members of the bar and brothers in law, and so uh, <laughs> and that's a good thing. And I hope sometime to maybe visit you out there in Colorado Springs, the <coughs> city of my birth. I have enjoyed my few uh, uh, traipses across the uh, the campus of the Air Force Academy. My thoughts are based uh, really on the, the, the limited research that I've conducted into the experiences of Latter-day Saints, uh, uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in uh, wartime environments, principally World War II, though I will say that we're making fairly uh, significant progress into the uh, conflicts of the Korean War and the Vietnam War uh, currently, and we hope someday to, to push even further. Uh, my credentials suggest that I might be one of the doves of the panelists today, and I'll try to be true to that uh, to that expectation as a religion professor that might, might be a guess, and uh, knowing that the time is limited, and I had really constrained myself here, I, I tried not to uh, beer over into areas that I thought Ron Walker especially would cover. But now I'm getting a little freer rein. We'll see where, where this goes. And, uh, and I'm advised by Corey that we really could get out of here a few minutes early, so maybe that's okay too. In very fact, I imagine that the other two panelists showed up, but they saw Eric in the lively debate at the last hour and probably <laughs> could have gone out. Yes, war is hell to both the Latter-day Saint and to the non-Latter-day Saint combatant. No great distinction needs to be made for the Latter-day Saint and for the soldier, not of our faith, in terms of what they confront. Both fight and die. Both deserve our deepest respect. They earn medals for valor. They waste precious years of their lives in prison camps. And both yearn for the guns of war to be silenced. There are other facets of the experience of the Latter-day Saint soldier that I want to uh, I want to share uh, as I've learned in a few minutes. But um, I'll just remind uh, the audience here of what is to me a, a rather startling fact, that w wars of the 20th century imposed more death and destruction upon the human race 
than all of the wars of the previous 19 centuries combined. And that's a statistic that uh, I share uh, fairly frequently, and yet it still seems to go over my head and most of the students I think that I, that I deal with. It just boggles the imagination. Uh, from a religious perspective, it's uh, instructive to me to note that at the outset of the 20th century, uh, then-President Lorenzo Snow warned the world of wars and rumors of wars and the calamities of wars, in some sense uh, challenging the, word, the world to somehow avert uh, that prediction. But nonetheless, it, it was a prediction which was fulfilled. Wars are generally fought by the young and inexperienced. World War II uh, is an example of this. And some of you know of the D-Day invasion at Normandy and General Eisenhower's uh, request that uh, he didn't want experienced warriors in that invasion. He wanted the young and, and in some sense, naive, um, the courageous that didn't understand uh, just how awful that experience in June of 1944 would be. Um, remember that World War II was a war in which uh, the children of the Depression were the uh, combatants. So sea rations and uh, other privations of war uh, maybe weren't as uh, difficult for them to endure, at least at one uh, level, than, than might be the case today. Uh, wars in the 20th century have consistently pitted good against evil. I'm, I'm firm in that conviction. I'm firm in that conviction. Why that simple comment might invite criticism and the um, uh, ultimate question of well, who decides and defines what is good and who is good and who is evil, I think there's general agreement, uh, sort of a reasonable man test, if you will, from the world of law, that uh, that uh, their little question that, uh, of the moral foundation or diabolical goals of such men as Mao and Stalin and of Hitler. And this point is important because it's a place where the Latter-day Saint soldier can begin to legitimize his participation in war. War is a topic of the scriptures. It is found in the Bible and it is found in the Book of Mormon. When the posture of the combatant uh, nation is one uh, of a defensive nature, i.e. in defense of our liberties, our families, our religion, then God goes before us. That's our conviction and our confidence. Uh, in addition, the Latter-day Saint uh, 12th article of faith goes further in that it places the burden of evaluating the rightness of military conflict squarely on the shoulders of the established leader, uh, leaders of belligerent nations. And I appreciate very much, Lieutenant uh, Colonel, your reference to the Helmut Hubner story. And, uh, and just to the German experience, I think the way in which the German Latter-day Saint soldier, who may have personally been very much opposed to the government of the Third Reich, the way in which he can allow himself to render service to the military is by uh, holding up the Twelfth Article of Faith as his mandate. By the way, uh, we hope it won't be very long before you can tell your students of the story of Helmut Huner in documentary form. I know of the play that you're talking about. We, we have the documentary completed of the story of Helmut Huebner. Beginning with the Mormon Battalion of uh, the Mexican-American War, Latter-day Saint in, in, uh, involvement in wartime has been quite consistent and even robust. The single exception in uh, Latter-day history would probably be the Civil War, and there are... Um, explanations about that, which I was going to leave to Ron Walker to simply signal that uh, our movement uh, west made uh, the perspective of Latter-day Saints it was an Eastern war. In some sense, we weren't uh, particularly friendly toward either side, the Union of the Confederacy, and we, we left it alone. We were sort of on a track toward divorce with the Union at that time anyway. The church and its people have consistently supported the call-up of its youth to fight, notwithstanding the fact that it is in some sense antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ, i.e., Doctrine and Covenants, section 98, renounce war, declare peace. It's, uh, I think, illustrative to note that of the current members of the First Presidency in the form of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, six are veterans of uh, World War II, and the majority 
of that population have at one time or another in their lives affiliated themselves with one or another of the branches of service. I think this is in some sense represent a representative snapshot of Latter-day Saint activity in the military. What we find is that uh, peacetime uh, enrollment in the military for Latter-day Saints tends to be lower than for the general populace. I think much of this owes to the cultural expectation and uh, theological ex expectation of uh, our young people to serve missions and sort of a two years is enough um, uh, plan. Summarizing the experience of Latter-day Saints in the military uh, would be impossible uh, over the uh, dispensation, if you will. But I'd like to list just in rapid-fire succession four or five dynamics which describe to me the Latter-day Saint soldier and their readiness and participation in the military. First, the Latter-day Latter Saint soldier makes a great physical candidate for war. Their conformance to the high dietary standards, to morality, standards makes the LDS soldier an unusually good soldier. They run faster, they're less prone to illness, and generally more serviceable than their peers. And that is really borne out by the research. Second, they fit easily into the military model of respect and order. Respect factor in part a result of the religious culture they come from, which values respect towards one's superiors, leaders. The LDS soldier is more apt to treat his superiors well gender's respect from his peers. While fre frequently the subject of harassment, even ridicule in the early going, the Latter-day Saint soldier tends to weather the storm, went over even their more ardent detractors, citing somehow a principle of opposition in all things. They tend to, over time, soften perceptions and uh, even gain uh, respect. The Latter-day Saint soldier is sickened by violence notwithstanding an example uh, proffered by uh, by my predecessor here on the at the stand I uh, and I'm aware of the Me Live massacre and I think I count three or four Latter day Saints probably being involved in that incident. Um, that certainly is an exception to the rule in general. The deep gut rushing question, why do I have to kill a fellow brother? is particularly difficult. Similarly the soldier wrestles with the issue of man's inhumanity toward men, or uh, men. Not all Latter-day Saints soldiers survive war with their spiritual lives intact. It should come as no surprise that some come home alienated from their God and religion. On a positive side, most soldiers do maintain their faith. Our research discloses that wartime experiences often produce within the Latter-day Saints soldier a spirit of renewed commitment to God and to gospel service. Occasional reports include a kind of deal-making in which the soldier promises to live a more committed life in the gospel if allowed to return home. May I add parenthetically, I suspect I would have been that kind of soldier. I would have prayed for preservation and I imagine at that time in my life would have had to renew a level of dedication. I, I might also add I've had the occasion to interview both Elder Maxwell and Elder David B. Haight of uh, the Quorum of the Twelve, and each has signaled that that was a time of just such commitment. And uh, a little awkwardness, as they admitted, maybe a little maturity in that deal-making, but that they, that they really felt that that was an important thing for them to do. Finally, the Latter-day Saint soldier is resilient. One of the most consistent trends of our veterans is their resiliency uh, factor. Even after prolonged exposure to the ravages of war, most return home and resume some form of a normal life. They go to college, they begin careers, they raise families. They are the scoutmasters and the bishops in their congregations, and in most ways, they go on with their lives. In some sense, they may reflect the confidence of Latter-day Saints in eternity. The idea that war is but for a brief moment even with its attendant hardships. And that to focus on an eternal journey buoys them up. They look to their great heroes in life. Joseph Smith, he endured much at Liberty Jail. His was but for a brief moment, a trial. Jesus Christ himself in, endured great tribulation. So I can get through my hardship. 
I would conclude with two thoughts from individuals uh, impacted by the war. The first is a Korean veteran, war veteran uh, account I very recently received, but I was touched by the perspective. And the second is that of a family member of a warrior who paid the ultimate price for freedom. Don George. It is now 50 years down the road, and my Korean War experiences are still very much a part of my life. I've been ruled 100% disabled by the Veterans Administration because of Miner's disease, my deafness, and other attendant concerns stemming from the war. I have less than 10% hearing in my left ear. My right ear has been deaf for 20 years or more. Um, tinnitus has uh, never left me for a single day, and attacks of vertigo have subsided uh, some in recent years. My head still has the pressure and unpleasantness that I've had most of my life since my Korean uh, injuries, Korean War inju injuries, headaches and pressure are my constant companions. My st stability is non-existent. I sometimes stagger like a drunken sailor. I walk with my arm around my wife to keep from staggering too much. Even she thinks I'm sometimes trying to knock her down. But I do it again in a heartbeat. I love my country, and I will always be a patriotic citizen. May God bless this country with a never-ending supply of patriotic young men to come to her aid in times of need. Just one perspective. I had a vet of the Korean War in my office this week. I was uh, impacted as he arrived. He came with a host. He was sightless. He was uh, nearly deaf. I had to use a special apparatus just so he and I could converse. And all of that owing to an incident during the Korean War. And uh, I was intrigued. One of his eyes I noticed early on in our interview. Uh, both glass eyes. He had an American flag tattooed on the glass eye. At some point I interrupted and I said, Is that an American flag on your eye? <laughs> yeah, what do you think? It's a good flag. No question about it. He was a marvelous man, a very patient uh, in, the, in, in the interview. He again expressed no, no hesitancy that he would go and do it again if his country called. And I might add to, to my friend, you know, the brother of the bar, he went on after his return home and studied law and became a successful attorney. The second and final uh, experience that I would just share is uh, one shared by the family member of one who paid the ultimate price for freedom. Uh, Sister Gloria Blasso, who reports, by the way, her brother was killed uh, on the uh, ship Bullhead, August 6, 1945, the very day the bomb was dropped, uh, the atomic bomb was dropped on uh, Hiroshima. When one loses a loved one, it is always an epical event. Yet war is a powerful, multi-dimensional uh, context within which, within which to lose someone. A context which sustains one's shock and sorrow within its historical framework. One ponders war from the beginning. And the ponder never ceases after its end. There is a lingering quest for meaning, not only for oneself, but for humanity. And I would just challenge from my perspective, may we uh, somehow approach always the conflict and war that is uh, indicative of the last day of, a, of the dispensation of which we are part with a soberness and an understanding of its awfulness and attendant consequences, and uh, may we be very straightforward in assessing and appraising um, that potential. Uh, thank you for letting me come. Thank you for your thoughtful and uh, provocative comments. Um, we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions I'd like to ask of the panelists before we uh, close the meeting today? Okay. I'm coming. One of the key aspects of a war in the Middle East that has uh, also been characteristic of other wars that we've fought uh, through our recent history is that they're not contiguous with the United States. Uh, to go to Korea, to go to Vietnam, to go to Panama to go to uh, 
uh, with with Europe, I think we felt a great a direct linkage to the preservation of our culture and to and to, to freedoms, but that linkage sometimes is held in question by uh, by people. My my question to you is, from a religious point of view, and you cited the Book of Mormon, and I think we can look to the Bible as well. Are there questions that we can answer from a religious perspective about fighting a distant war in a foreign land? Nothing comes to mind. Is this on? Uh, nothing comes to mind directly to me uh, on the distance issue, um, and I can't frankly say that I've thought about that as much as I see the issue of whether or not to fight a defensive war or an aggressive war, and the one that I'm sure that everyone in an LDS community has thought about and raised the issue in discussion and so forth. Uh, has been the uh, situation in the Book of Mormon where uh, the Nephites who are at, a, I guess, one of their generally righteous states at the time continue to prevail as long as they are fighting a defensive war. But then when they get a little full of themselves and decide to go on the offensive, then they uh, actually go and, and suffer a terrible loss. Uh, is that a principle? Is there a principle there that we can apply and, and say that's always going to be the case, that God will never sustain a, an offensive war, and then, and then you start defining uh, preemptive strike? Is that, a, is that an offensive war, or is that a defensive war sort of in, in, uh, in reverse, or, or what? That becomes a very, very complicated thing. And I think it's more a question of the, the spirit of of the nation and the individuals of the nation, but there's a spirit that takes hold. And if that becomes a question of arrogance, and if it becomes a question of we really are the only people on this earth who count, and we really are the ones who are right, and and this is sort of why I hit my students with Meli after we've already showed them that everybody else has done these bad things, is just to remind them uh, that, uh, and we don't just do it in a negative way. We don't just remind them that we can be bad too, but we try to remind them that other people can be good to, and I had a privilege of working for a couple of years in the United Nations, plus the time I spent with the Germans, where I was the only American for years, and uh, and some people say, oh, you went native, and I said, not really, but I certainly learned that there are, that there are all God's children out there, and, and I can see why God would not smile upon uh, an arrogant ethnocentricity that would propel us to go to battle in an aggressive way when it really wasn't necessary. Can I just tail on that as well? And um, the, the note on geography is an interesting one to me. I, I uh, listened yesterday to a news report disclosing that most of American youth couldn't anymore find Iraq on a map than, than fly. I mean, they just, if we want to ignore that part of the world it is. And, you know, I, I'm sure that that kind of experience was uh, was the case with the Korean War and, and Vietnam. I know in my interviews of World War II veterans, a uh, very common uh, sharing is we had no idea where Pearl Harbor was, but we felt like we should sign up, so we signed up. <laughs> and they go to war in a place that they can't even locate. And so, um, notwithstanding the fact that we live in a sort of geography-challenged world and we have a hard time sometimes associating with where is this, and what is and what is the impact of that place on on my homeland? Um, I think I think the greater question, obviously, is the rightness of the of the of the position that we represent. And I'm still smarting a little bit. I have to confess at some of the media reactions to the uh, October 2002 General Conference address by uh, Elder uh, Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve who laid out beautifully the uh, position, and it's unaltered from the Spanish-American War, which is, I think, Mon Walker would tell us, the sort of defining moment of our position relative to war. And um, when we do and, and when we don't uh, support the notion of conflict as a, as a right idea. So uh, spending, spending our, investing our effort in really understanding the issues, I mean, that's, that's where we need to be. One more question. 
Um, here's a question for you that <clears throat> doesn't have to do so much with the LDS perspective, uh, rather the, the U.S. policy um, regarding religious matters. When involved in a conflict with a foreign nation, um, to give an example, uh, an Islamic nation, uh, what kind of moral responsibility does the military have to respect uh, beliefs such as Ramadan, a holy month? I know there's been talk of, uh, of, of there being a peace in that time. Or do you think that it's, it's advisable that we refrain from military activity? Well, there's the cynical answer and there's the not so cynical answer. And uh, it's, uh, in, in general, the principles that are taught are to respect people's ethnicity, people's religions, people's mores and values. And in general, that is something that, uh, as long as it wasn't going to cost us the war, we would try to do. But if it's uh, seen as, uh, and again, I'm speaking for myself, this is kind of the cynical view of it, would be that if it really were seen as imperative for victory, for a decisive victory to act during Ramadan, then uh, the United States would act during Ramadan. That's what I think. <laughs> Uh, recently we've had three books come out on the Mount Metal Massacre in the context of the Utah War. Uh, in a couple of comments, uh, any conclusions, any insights, any sage remarks? Very context sensitive uh, story is the story of Mountain Meadows, and I really don't have a comment other than to say uh, keep reading because I think there will yet be a, another book out <laughs> that will provide a little different perspective. And Glenn Leonard at L are working very hard to make sure that that reflects you know, an objective view of, of the facts as well. So. Corey probably has the best answer to that. It's well, my father. Yes. <laughs> I, think the Corey. <laughs> I think the conclusion or the answer to that question is we wish Ron Walker were here. So. Yes, and Ron's with it. I'd like to thank the panelists for today and also invite you to tomorrow, which I think will continue uh, to be enriching uh, three more panels until a free lunch. We'll, we'll say that. Um, we'll begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow uh, addressing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, after that, we will discuss the global economy and, and economic issues, and then we will conclude on military strategy and tactics. Um, we thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.